Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about recording ProRes RAW with Zcam. We're going to take a look inside Premiere Pro and Final Cut Pro and also Resolve. So I'm going to talk about transcoding ProRes RAW into something that you can use in Resolve. This is the Zcam E2 F6. It's one of many cameras that can output but not record ProRes RAW. I'll link to this article on the BH website. It lists the devices that can record ProRes RAW and also has this list of all the cameras that output ProRes RAW. You can record ProRes RAW from all these cameras using Atomos devices. This is an Atomos Ninja V, which can record ProRes RAW. So why can't you just record it inside the camera? Well, that's because RED has a patent that specifically covers compressed RAW recording. They have the rights in many countries to license that technology, and it prevents other companies from doing that internally. So Zcam doesn't have a license from RED to do that, but Atomos does. To record ProRes RAW with this equipment, you need to set the camera to output ProRes RAW and connect it via HDMI to the Ninja V. This will detect the signal and automatically adjust itself to record ProRes RAW. Recording externally like this is only slightly more cumbersome than recording in a non-RAW codec in the camera, since I generally have a monitor like this connected to my camera anyway. So why would you want to record ProRes RAW? Well, ProRes RAW is a compressed RAW codec that gives you all of the benefits of a RAW signal at smaller file sizes. Now, while some cameras can record uncompressed RAW, those files are generally very large and difficult to manage. They require too much storage for most video projects, and they can be difficult to edit. Now, I'm not going to convince you of why you should record in ProRes RAW, I'm just going to show you how. And just for reference, I'm using this Sony 500 gigabyte SSD on the back. It's designed for the uh, Atomos recorder, so it's the shorter size. And here's my NPF battery, so keeping it very simple. I have my Zcam with a simple HDMI cable running into the Atomos Ninja V. Both of these are running on batteries. I'm keeping it very simple here. Uh, the first thing you want to make sure is that you have the right firmware in both of these devices. So I'm going to tap up here in the menu, maybe. There we go. And I have version 10.51 on the Ninja V. And in my Zcam, I have version 0.96. Both of these will work for ProRes RAW. Anything newer than this should be fine as well. So once you have your firmware up to date, you come up here and hit right there, record. And you'll get this menu it has uh, your codec and your compression options. So if I tap on this one, you'll see I can jump to ProRes RAW. There's DNX HR back to ProRes. So I'll hit ProRes RAW, hit confirm, and it's going to do a quick little cycle here. And that'll say ProRes RAW HQ. I don't really want to record in HQ. It's slightly higher quality, more uh, bit rate, bigger file sizes. I'm to use ProRes RAW. And then come over to the input menu and make sure it matches the camera that you are using. Now, my Zcam, there's only a couple of resolution options that are supported for ProRes RAW. I have 6K, DCI 4K, and 4K, and both of these modes are a crop of the sensor. Since this is RAW, it can't downscale that image. It's going to give you just a crop of that sensor, but it's still a RAW image. And this down here at the very bottom of the page is RAW over HDMI. That's where you turn that on and off. And when you do, there's a slight delay as it changes. And you can see if I go back up here, I have all my options for resolution now. But for ProRes RAW, I have just the three. I'll change mine to 6K, so I get the most resolution I can out of my camera, and also a slightly wider field of view. Now, the first thing you'll notice right away is Look how dim this image is compared to the on-camera screen. That's because we got to deal with monitoring ProRes RAW signal on this monitor. Now, when I first tried to do this, I thought I was exposing correctly, and I found out when I brought it in the post that I was overexposing everything because I was looking at this dark image. It's because I'm used to, na to viewing in native mode. You see, if you click this button here, you have native, Rec. 709, HLG, PQ, and LUT. I always use native when I'm recording just ProRes because it shows me everything in the IRE scale and it's just a one-to-one -one image, there's nothing going on, and so I know exactly where my image sits um, from the camera. But when you go to ProRes RAW, you gotta realize that that's a format that has a huge range um, of luminance and chroma, and how do you view that on a display like this? I mean, it's a raw signal in the first place, so it's, it's just data. It doesn't actually have an image. There's no profile attached to it, so this display has to do something with it. And in native mode, it looks like this, and it's not usable. Now, you might come along here and say, well, I need to up my exposure, so let me crank my ISO up here, which, by the way, the limit is ISO 8000 when you're um, recording um, 
when you're outputting ProRes RAW that the Zcam will top out at ISO 8000. You can go higher than that in post, but in camera, ISO 8000 is your max. Now, this is still dim. Now, if I look at my waveform monitor, there we go. You'll see if I zoom it in, let me go into my menu, get the big one. Right here around 400, it's really hard to see, but at 400, everything stops. You can't monitor in native mode because everything clips at 400 on the scale, which I believe is a, is a nit scale. And so the image is too dark and you can't, you have no idea where you're supposed to expose that, right? So what do you do? Well, let's try one of these other modes. Let's try Rec 709. Okay, well, oops, let me go back here. I can see that everything looks like it's really, really hot. So let me just pull my aperture down here. All right, that looks better. Is that, is that the right way to view it though? Is that actually exposing well? Because that looks like it's overexposed right here in the face of my, that plush there. So I'm not sure, let's, let's try a different mode. Let's try HLG. Okay, well that certainly looks a lot better. But again, is that a good exposure or not? I'm not really sure what this monitor is doing. What, is, what does HLG mean? I know it means hybrid log gamma, but what does that mean as far as the display on this? And I mean, you can see the scale is zero to 50, and then I can't even see the top number. I, I, I just don't know what this means. And same with PQ, now the scale is zero to 400. Again, I don't know what this means. Now when you go to LUT, you have the option of choosing which LUT you want to view. And let me find that here, LUTs. So you can load in different kinds of LUTs. So I have uh, some of the Z-Log standard LUTs in here. But I also have this one I call no LUT. And what this is, is a LUT that has no adjustments. It's not doing anything to the signal. And you can see though, if I go back to the, uh, to the viewing method here, that it definitely does something to the signal compared to native this LUT mode is doing something to the signal. Now, I get a standard zero to 100 IRE scale. I know what that means, I'm used to that, right? So, as far as I know, this is showing me everything I need to know. And I know from experience that this is indeed the best way to view ProRes RAW with the Atomos Ninja V. So I'll make this LUT available. It's like I said, there's no adjustments on it. It's simply, I went into Resolve with a node that had nothing on it and I just output a LUT. So I have a LUT, like load into here, and it does nothing to the signal except show me um, a mapped values of the ProRes RAW signal into something that's probably Rec 709-ish, but without having a more Rec 709 look where the contrast and color is pushed up. So I found it with experience that this is giving me something that I can actually use to monitor with, and the 100 IRE up here, that is the actual clipping point and the zero down here, yeah, anything below that is too dark. It's, it's gonna be crushed. So this is the mode that I recommend using for exposing ProRes RAW. It was really frustrating trying to figure this out. I posted a couple times on the Zcam group and I believe the Atomos group as well on Facebook about, you know, hey, what's going on? How, do I supposed to, how am I supposed to monitor this thing? You gotta understand that there's multiple different cameras that are outputting ProRes RAW and they all have different sensors and there's different things going on inside of those cameras internally uh, before it even hits the Atomos. And so this thing has to deal with all kinds of different signals and it's gotta do something with that signal to display it on the screen. And um, like I said, in my experience, this is the only mode that I can find that I, I can rely on to get a proper exposure. The native mode is just absolutely out of the question. It's too dark no matter what you do with it and it clips at 400, at least with this camera. So it's just completely unusable. This is the best mode. Now let's step inside Final Cut Pro and see how it handles ProRes RAW. So here I'm in Final Cut, and this is version 10.4.10, which is uh, fairly recent. I've made a new event and then made a timeline inside that event. They call this a project. And uh, my project is Wide Gamut HDR Rec 2020. I'm doing this because that's kind of how Final Cut Pro treats ProRes RAW files. So I'm just gonna drag a file in here. I've got a, a folder full of all these videos. These are the ones I made my uh, Yellowstone video out of. I'm gonna drag this one in because it has some movement so we can see what's going on and put it right in my timeline. And we see it right away that I can scrub through this no problem, it's perfectly smooth. If I hit play, it plays back again, perfectly smooth. Um, since both ProRes RAW and Final Cut Pro are Apple products, they work together perfectly. Now by default, if you're on this eye icon, when you have got a clip selected here, uh, it's gonna show you information about your clip and it might be set to basic when you first get into Pro, uh, Final Cut Pro. So if you go into settings, 
you'll see here we have our raw controls. So we have ISO and color temperature. And we can also do some uh, raw to log conversions. So if you're familiar with working with, say, Panasonic's V-Log or any of these other ones, including Canon Log, you can set that here. It's going to convert it to a log, and then you can also just apply a LUT right away, and this brings it into a Rec. 709 space, or I guess since I'm in a um, Rec. 2020 timeline, this will move it into a, an HDR color space. I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm a little more adventuresome, and I tend to not use these conversions, and I just grade directly, although I don't use Final Cut Pro to make my videos, so need to convert this into a format that I can use in my preferred video editing software, which is DaVinci Resolve. But this is the basics of um, what it looks like when you bring ProRes RAW into Final Cut Pro. Now let's say that our project was not Rec. 2020 and it was just a standard Rec. 709. So let's change that and now see what happens here. We can see our image has changed. Uh, we're on a uh, 0 to 100 IRE scale now. And if I click on my video, I can adjust my exposure and you know it's looking okay for a Rec. 2020 timeline or excuse me a Rec. 709 timeline. I can also leave it there and then see what happens when I do this conversion using Panasonic's V-Log. Didn't really change. Um, whatever Final Cut Pro is doing to this signal I think it more or less keeps it within um, the color space you're in but I could, could be completely wrong about that. Let's um, do something else here. There's a tool called HDR Tools. And I think I can just drop that on my footage. And if I go over here, yeah, see HDR to Rec. 709. So it did do something. We saw our image shift here. It turned this ProRes RAW, um, which they consider an HDR color space in Final Cut Pro, into um, a Rec. 709 color space. So it brought down the levels, brought them all within um, the Rec. 709 color space here. And it kind of made it look more like log footage, like a, like it applied a log profile to it, kind of. That's more or less how it looks to my eye. Again, ProRes RAW is a raw signal. It doesn't have a color profile. It's just data. So from here, you can grade as, as normal. Say you want to uh, jump up the saturation. That's what I would do, like a lot. And then you can play with your exposure here. You can drop down your shadows and then jump up your highlights. Whatever you do to grade your footage, you can do that from here. There's just a lot of ways to work. If you're not uploading in HDR, which I imagine most of you aren't, then it would make sense to stick with a Rec. 709 timeline. However, if you, if you want to just use Final Cut Pro to output, to transcode ProRes RAW and do something else, then I recommend keeping it in Rec. 2020. Let's remove our HDR color tools, Let's just disable that. And then from here, I also need to reset these. And all these. From here, you can just simply use the timeline to transcode. You hit this button here. I've made a ProRes 4444 template or preset, I guess you'd call it. Let's look at the settings. So that's ProRes 4444 and it's going to use the color space of my timeline, which is wide gamut Rec. 2020. It's also going to do the same resolution as my timeline. Now let's say you, you just want to do act as a transcode, then you need to change your timeline resolution to match your clip resolution. So come over here and select custom, and you can set the resolution here, which is something like 5760 by, I don't know, 32 something, 3260. It's something like that. I'd have to look at my, my file here to see it. Let's look at the information. Oh, well, this is a 4K file, so it's 4096 by 2160. So if I wanted to do a one-to-one, -one, I would just need to go back to my settings here, set my timeline to that, and then I can just hit this button here and output a ProRes 4444 file, and it's going to give me a basically a transcode of ProRes RAW uh, into a non-ProRes RAW file, just a basic Apple ProRes file. Now, of course, the downside of doing this is that the file sizes are larger, 
uh, this ProRes 4444 file will be larger than the original ProRes RAW file. And also, it just takes time to do this. And I would have to do this clip by clip. Obviously, if you're, tr if you're exporting your entire timeline, um, that wouldn't work for multiple clips. You just have multiple clips back to back rather than having individual clips. You could do that if you want, but it's not a very efficient way of working. And it would, again, take a long time to transcode all these files. Now, Final Cut Pro does have a way of making proxies. If you right click on a file, you hit transcode media. See so here, create proxy media, but that's not necessarily what we want to do because I think by default it uses ProRes Proxy, which is a very low quality ProRes file. And I'm not sure how it handles the luminance and chroma coming off of a ProRes RAW file. And you'll notice that create optimized media, which would be preferred, it's grayed out. It says here disabled because the original camera format can be edited with good performance on this computer. So Final Cut's making a decision for us saying that uh, we're not going to give you this option to optimize media since the media is already working well on your computer. I don't really like that. Um, I'd rather have the control over that, especially since I'd, write, I'd like to use this feature to make a transcode, but you don't have that option here. So I guess what I'm saying is that Final Cut Pro is probably not a great option for making transcodes of ProRes RAW. So let's look at a different piece of software that might be a good choice to use to transcode ProRes RAW. This is Premiere Pro. This is version 14.5.0 build 51. So I'm gonna drag in that same clip over here, and unfortunately, the first time I did this, it took almost a minute. It was spinning, spinning a gear and trying to think and do something. I don't know what it was doing. So I'm gonna take this, throw it into my timeline, and we can see right away again, I have smooth scrubbing and smooth playback in Premiere, which is great. Now, if you're on Windows, this might be a little different. You might have to install some kind of a plugin or something to make it work with ProRes RAW. I'm not really sure, but since I'm on a Mac, it just works great. I didn't have to install anything. Maybe I did and I forgot, I don't know. It's kind of a weird land here dealing with ProRes RAW. But anyway, um, let's go over to the color tab here. We can take a look at our scopes. We can see that kind of like it was in Final Cut Pro, it goes off the top here. This red is way above 100 IRE. I'm in just a standard Rec 709 timeline here. Um, but if you go over to, I know on the editing page, if I click on my tab, well, I can do it over here, I guess. If I click on my clip, go to effects and click on the master clip, here I have my ProRes RAW source setting. So exposure sliding, slider here, and jump my exposure down. It's not really the same thing as ISO, I don't think. Maybe it is. But then also here you can change your color space. So if you want to jump into a, a V-Log profile, there you go. It looks super flat now. But again, I'm the kind of person who wants to grade and just rec 709. I come over here to my exposure and make adjustments. You know, the highlights are too bright or whatever. There we go, it's already coming together. Jump my saturation up and grade just like you would in Final Cut Pro. Now let's look at using Premiere to transcode media. Instead of using this clip, I'm gonna use a different clip that has a greater um, dynamic range or it has a lot brighter part of the image because I know uh, I'm gonna run into an issue here. So this one here, I've got a waterfall and it's, it's very bright. This water looks super, super bright. Of course, um, in ProRes RAW, the information's all there. Um, so let's look at this. There's an option up here in Project Manager to consolidate and transcode. Um, this doesn't, it didn't transcode when I tried it, so uh, all I did was make copies of my files. So you'd have to use, I think maybe you can use like a, uh, a certain type of uh, preset to transcode, but I'm not sure. Um, Premiere doesn't really transcode. What it does is if you select these files and you, you go up to either up here to uh, export media, or you hit Apple M, or you right click and say, um, I just saw it, export media. It's going to pass this off to Adobe Media Encoder. It's a different, different application. So let's just go over there right now. Um, I can do it from here, in fact. If I just select, I'm gonna put on 422 to begin with. I know that this probably is not gonna work. So just for giggles, I hit Q, it's gonna do this, and then it's gonna to start to open up Adobe Media Encoder. All right, so here it brought in my two clips into Adobe Media Encoder. And if we check the uh, settings, it retained the settings that I selected in Premiere. And we can see that this looks, looks pretty darn hot. And I can tell you from experience that Yes, indeed, it is clipped. 
So you can't use Adobe Media Encoder to encode ProRes 4.2.2 files. Here I go to my ProRes 4.2.2 and pull in that same waterfall clip. So this is the 4.2.2 version. Okay, it looks clipped, and if I try pulling it down, we can see that. See how this flat lines? This is clipped information. There's no recovery from this. So this won't work. Well, what can we use? I found that ProRes 4444 works if you set one of these to Rec 2100, HLG, or PQ. Either one works. We can see how it makes it look kind of flat. It's because that, that's what it looks like when you make this a, an HDR color space and I'm on a Rec uh, 709 monitor, it looks like this. So by doing that, that will give us a transcode that actually looks good. So let me get rid of this, take it out of my timeline, my pool altogether, and if I bring in that file, which is under my ProRes 4444 transcode, here it is. Okay, so see already it looks better. It's off the top, but if I pull it down, we see that there's nothing clipped. All of my information is there. It looks pretty good. So that's the, the secret here is in Adobe Media Encoder, you need to use ProRes 4444 and then set the export, export color space to one of the Rec 2100 settings. It doesn't matter which one you want to use. It's up to you. And you can, you can toggle this on and off if you want. I don't know. You can experiment with There's There's a couple settings in here. But you're kind of limited with Adobe Media Encoder and Adobe in general because you can't get a ProRes 422 file, you have to use ProRes 4444. And the problem with that is the files are much larger. They're larger than the original ProRes RAW files to begin with, and uh, they're high bit rate. So unless you're using SSDs or very fast spinning disk hard drives, it's gonna play back a little slow on your system. It plays back slow on my system when I'm coming off of a hard disk drive. On SSD, it's fine. So what can we do to get a ProRes 422 file? Well, there's another piece of software I haven't talked about yet. It's called Assimilate Scratch. Um, it does transcode to 422 and retain all of the information. So let's look at how that's done. This is Scratch. I haven't used the software before today, and there's way too much for me to try to even cover in a video like this. So I'm going to keep it pretty simple. It's the only software that I've found that I can produce a ProRes 422 file from ProRes RAW. Uh, the only thing you'll suffer is a slightly lower color bit depth. Uh, ProRes 422 is only 10-bit and ProRes RAW is 12-bit, but for my use that's perfectly fine. So let me walk you through what I've done here. And I've had a lot of help from um, one of their product engineers, had to ask a lot of questions on how to get that ProRes 422 file. Everything I tried, I ended up with clipped highlights. So I brought in my ProRes file here. Um, you do it to this Im import dialog. Um, so I selected my file from way over here in my big catalog of ProRes files. Anyway, you put that here and then you can jump right over to the color effects page and you got to set a couple things here. So if you're on the QuickTime tab, this is actually looking right at the ProRes file. This is the DBayer color space. So I've set this to Rec 2020 PQ HDR and this is important. You need to use the HDR color space to preserve all the color and luminance in the ProRes RAW file. Same thing for media, it should follow. Once you change it here, this should follow to Rec 2020 PQ HDR. And if you wanna make adjustments here, you can. There's all kinds of adjustments in this software. Um, you can apply LUTs, your curves. Um, if you look at the numbers here, you can see all the different settings that you can set. It's pretty powerful. So this is fine. Um, it looks good here on the scopes. And if you go to the render page, there's a couple things you need to set here. So this is the, uh, the node coming from my timeline. I want to make sure that this is uh, not applying this. That's, that's on. This is off. And then uh, I need to make a timeline, or excuse me, a ProRes encoder node. I only made, already made one here, but I'll do it again just to show you what I've done. Um, I've selected just ProRes 422, channels 3 and 4 in the audio because those are the only two channels that have audio. Um, HDR metadata, this is set automatically, this is good. And again, I need to set this to Rec 2020 and PQ HDR. So you can see how there's a lot of places where you need to set this. So there's one over here in the QuickTime, there's one here in the media page, 
you need to set, make sure it's not doing anything here. You're basically bypassing this. And then on your ProRes encoder, you need to make sure this is set to um, the same as what you've had over here on the color page. So once you have all of that set, you can just hit render and it's gonna render out a ProRes 422 file. And I have one here and we can see that, boom. It's, it recognizes it as HDR, so it has the, the nit scale that goes up to 10,000. It looks pretty flat, but that's what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> and so you can see I'm not, not nothing is clipped here, and you can see in the waveform nothing is clipped. And from here, I can just start grading as I normally would. Um, I would go to contrast and jump that up. This software works a little differently. When you click on a, on a setting, you work in a circle around it, and that's how you adjust its level. It's pretty interesting. Then I'd come over here to, uh, which one is it, primary, and jump up the saturation. So now this is starting to look like a normal image already. So that's a really short version of how to use, oh, I forgot one thing, <laughs> sorry. This is important too. Um, I gotta figure out where it's at now. Oh, color page. You go to settings, monitor, and make sure everything here is set to source. What this does uh, is it bypasses the color management system that's inside of Scratch, and that's what you want to have. And that's what makes this all work. If you don't have these um, set to source, then you probably will end up something different here on the output than, than I did. So anyway, that's that's the, the really quick version of how to use Scratch to encode. And if you happen to have more than one um, clip on your timeline here. Let me go back over here and add another clip just randomly. So this is good. So now I have two clips here on my timeline. You can see that one and then this one. You need to make sure that for your settings right here, you need to put the S name. It has this system of tags. That's the source name. So you can see how it put in the ninja file name. It was reading the original file name. Make sure you have that in there and you can put anything you want before it, like this, because if you don't do that, it's gonna render a single timeline instead of individual clips. So by having this unique file name in there, it will render every clip in your timeline as its own clip on the output. So that's also very important. Now that we've finally managed to make some transcodes, I've come back into Resolve and I brought these into my timeline and I wanna look at the couple of different versions that we have. So this is the ProRes 422 file, if I look at my my media pool here, we can see that it's 10 bit depth. This is the one that I made in Adobe Media Encoder. If I jump over to the color page, we can see that I cannot bring this down enough to preserve anything. It is clipped hard. So I pull it down, we can see the top here is flat line. So all that water is still clipped here, just like it was in Premiere Pro. Clipped is clipped. Now here is the 4444 file that I made with Adobe Media Encoder. And this one is not clipped. In fact, right away, it's all within the range here of my Rec. 709 timeline. Then this is the one from scratch. And it looks different though. You notice how this is looks normal. Looks like it, there's no log profile or anything. It looks like a normal image, almost like a Rec. 709 image. Whereas the one from scratch does not. It looks like there's some kind of log profile going on here. I can't really explain the difference but uh, this is a ProRes 4444, and I'm not doing anything to it, whereas this is a ProRes 422, and I'm also not doing anything to it, but I could grade like normal from here, apply some contrast, not too much contrast, and uh, apply some saturation, and then you know we're already getting pretty close to this look here, which interestingly looks like it cropped in. That's something I'll have to look at. I think my timeline might have been set um, differently in that's interesting. Yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to check the setting for the timeline. Apparently that's something I have to be concerned about. I didn't realize it would crop in like that. So I think what I have here is this is my 6K image and I cropped it into a, a 4K DCI image here. Um, one thing I didn't talk about is the Adobe Media Encoder has a bug. This is something that's a bug in, in Adobe. Uh, you can see there's a black border. If I zoom in this way, you can see there's a black border around this image. If I if I went in really far, sorry, I'm trying to do this on my 
you can see there's this green edge at the bottom here. That shows up in your footage. It's, it's not in the ProRes RAW file. It's something that Adobe did to this image when I converted it. It's a bug and it just doesn't know how to read the ProRes RAW file correctly. It's doing something odd. I don't have that issue with, with um, Final Cut Pro. Uh, Scratch doesn't have that issue. It's just something that Adobe has. Anyway, um, ignoring the crop because I have it set to a different resolution in Scratch, uh, this is giving me a perfectly usable image that's only 422. Now the biggest difference is in the file sizes. So let me go look at these if I can. So viewing this ProRes 4444 file, we can see that it's 11.87 gigabytes. Now if I go over to my scratch file that's a ProRes 422, it's 2.39 gigabytes. That is substantially smaller. This is quite a bit smaller than the original ProRes file. If I find that one here. This is 9.54 gigabytes. So we can see that the ProRes 4444 is the largest file. The ProRes RAW, which is the original file, is smaller, but you can't beat a ProRes 422 file. It's just tiny by comparison. And again, the resolution is not quite the same size, so you have to count for that. But still, we're talking, you know, maybe a quarter of the size or a third of the size simply because it's not it doesn't have as much bit depth, it doesn't have as much information, so the file size is quite a bit smaller. So that's a big benefit, and that's one reason why I think out of all these pieces of software, Scratch is probably the best one for transcoding. Now, right now, it's been free, I believe up until November 3rd, it's free to use. Uh, you have a 30-day trial if you download it also, and beyond that, uh, their pricing is gonna change here. I believe they're gonna offer some, some sales, some discounts, some promotions, um, something that Atomos is going to advertise, I believe, also. So look for that if you're interested in using Scratch to transcode, because it's, it's definitely the best option. Um, it's complicated, you'll have to figure out how to use it, but it has the best options, simply because you can't get a ProRes 422 file from any other software that I've found. I'm not even sure if Final Cut Pro will do that. If you applied, the HDR tools to their footage and then export each clip individually, you could make that work, but that's a painfully slow process. You have to bring them in your timeline one at a time. It's really not a practical way of working. If you want to transcode in batch and get 422 files, Scratch is really your only option right now. If you're okay with 4444 files and you don't mind the massive file sizes, then uh, you can use Adobe Media Encoder. It works fine. As you can see, there's still a lot of growing pains with ProRes RAW. Software support is kind of missing. Even Premiere Pro, which you can play it back in, doesn't have the RAW controls for ISO and white balance yet. If you have to go to something like DaVinci Resolve, then you have to deal with transcoding. And so it's a bit of a hassle still. Uh, hopefully it'll get better in the future. It'd be great if Blackmagic would just adopt ProRes RAW. They're kind of sticking out now as one of the few manufacturers who don't support that codec yet. So anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and a thumbs up and uh, consider subscribing. I've got more reviews coming up. I've got some camera comparisons and other things coming up in the future. So I'll see you then.